in this video, I'm going to show you the results of a DNA profile for a typical Hebridean, me. My ancestry on the island goes back for as far as I can trace it, with hardly any external influence. Apart from one distant ancestor on my mother's side and one possible one on my father's, both more than five generations ago. So this profile should be pretty typical of a native islander. Before I start, however, I'd like to go into how the DNA science works. This is because I've seen quite a lot of videos on the internet with people presenting their results pretty uncritically and not apparently understanding the limitations of what they're reading. If you're not interested in this and you just want to see the results, then skip ahead to the second video, which I'll reference in the top right corner of this one, and you can see the actual results. So let's have a look at the science. The way the body operates is subtle and complex, so I've simplified this explanation somewhat. Our bodies are made up of about 40 trillion cells. Almost all of these contain a full copy of our DNA. This is the code which makes us individual living organisms. The DNA is a unique string which is made up of four different chemicals, which are usually labelled C, G, A and T. These are called the bases. And there are about 3 billion of these bases in our DNA making up our code. What this code mostly specifies are proteins. Proteins are what make up our bodies, our hair, our skin, our muscle. But they also direct how these things are put together when we are born. Even things like bone, which are not made of protein, are laid down by the proteins acting together to coordinate them. Roughly speaking, the DNA segment which codes for a single particular protein is called a gene. The DNA in your cells is not arranged in one long continuous string but is split into smaller packages called chromosomes. The human being has 23 pairs of these, that is, a total of 46 altogether. One of the pairs is inherited from your mother, and the other one from your father. So your father and mother both pass on to you 50% of their DNA, that is, 23 chromosomes each. So we have a full complement of 46, that is, 23 pairs. The two chromosomes which make up each pair are duplicates. They have the same genes. However, it's very likely that the code in these genes is slightly different between the copy that you have from your mother and the copy you have from your father. This is because of mutation, which I'll explain later. So if we have two different genes, which one does the body use? In many cases, one gene type is dominant and the other is recessive and the dominant type will be expressed. However, in some other cases, both genes are expressed to different amounts and many traits that we have as human beings depend on several genes acting together. Let's look now how you pass on your DNA to your children. Both the sperm from the father and the egg from the mother start as a normal cell with 23 pairs of chromosomes, in other words, the full complement of 46. But they become either a sperm or an egg through a process called meiosis. In meiosis, the chromosomes come together in pairs and mix up each other's genes. This process is called recombination or crossover, and it is random. It results in two mixed up chromosomes. In the next stage, the cell splits and one of the pairs ends up in the germ cell. The germ cell is just another name for the egg of a sperm. In this way, the germ cells end up with half the number of chromosomes of a normal cell, in other words, 23 instead of 46. 
And when the egg is fertilized by the sperm, these 23 come together to form the full 46 again. Something important to note about this is that although you end up with exactly 50% of your genetic material from your mother and 50% from your father, you don't necessarily get 25% from your grandparents. In fact, it's very unlikely you will. This is because of a crossover which has mixed up the genetic material. So a genetic signal can disappear from your DNA in a couple of generations. This is why people are sometimes very surprised that a part of their heritage is missing from their genetic profile. We now reach the really interesting part of DNA genetics, that is mutation. DNA can change by accident. This might be because of a mistake made when it's copied, or because of some nasty thing in the environment which has disrupted it, for example, chemicals or radiation. These changes in the code are called mutations. Mutations occur in all our cells. In fact, if they interfere with a cell operation and cause a cell to proliferate uncontrollably, they are the cause of cancer. However, mutations in the germ cells or their precursors can be passed on to the next generation, whereas mutations in our normal cells can't. It's mutations which allow us to use the DNA to trace our ancestry. If a mutation occurs in a person in a particular geographical location, then it might become common in the population as people with it reproduce. As people with a particular mutation move away over time from its place of origin, we can see a pattern emerging of a concentration. I've illustrated this in the diagram. Parts of the population may pick up other mutations, allowing us to trace a history of that particular population. If it were just that simple, then DNA ancestry stories would be easy to interpret, but it's not. Firstly, although the mutation rate is statistically regular, individual mutations occur randomly. So two might follow each other in short order, or might be well spaced apart. The same mutation might also occur in unconnected populations. Some parts of the DNA are more heavily conserved than others, and so mutations are rarer in them. So rather than single mutations, it's much more accurate to interpret the results from patterns of them. But DNA companies generally don't supply this information in an easy to understand form, so it's very difficult to interpret. The spread of mutation carriers can also be limited by geographical issues, for example, mountain ranges or sociological ones, like interbreeding patterns between related and unrelated tribes. Natural disasters, war or famine, may wipe out genes in their source areas or spread them far and wide. All this means that we have to treat ancestry from DNA-derived data with caution. And look not just at its suggested proportions, but also at the uncertainty associated with these. And even then, take into account the sample of the total population which was used to derive those numbers. Finally, it's important to note that there are three common sources of DNA used in these analyses. The first one is the one we've just been discussing, DNA from the nucleus of your cells. This is called autosomal DNA, and this is what is passed on from your parents, and we've just been discussing over the last couple of minutes. There is, however, another source of DNA which is passed to you from your mother, and which is resident in structures within your cells called mitochondria. These provide the power from the cells, and they're only inherited from your mother because they're present in your mother's egg. But the mitochondria and the sperm are discarded when the egg is fertilized. Mitochondrial DNA shows that we all are descended from a single woman who was living in Africa, and that is every person alive today on Earth. And this woman is sometimes given the name Mitochondrial Eve. In men only, DNA from a Y chromosome is inherited from their fathers, and in turn from their fathers, and so on. Both these different types of DNA, Y and mitochondrial, 
tell us a small amount about our deep ancestry, but only through a single line, through the matrilineal line, all the females, or the paternal line, all the males. And although this is interesting, it doesn't tell us much about the mix which makes us all up. Finally, we should note that all modern humans can be traced through their DNA back to a small population of a few thousand individuals which left Africa, which is the true homeland of humans, sometime between 60,000 and 150,000 years ago.